So this is day 88 of Through the Bible in one year. And in today's Bible study reading, we're going to be focusing on day 88, which is 1 Samuel 9 to 12. And what we basically do here is we want to provide you with a step-by-step Bible study every single day of the year for you to literally walk through the Bible um, and see how easily you can do it, spending less than an hour every single day. So in today's video, we're going to be focusing on five key things that happen. The first thing we're going to have, we're going to see is that God tells Samuel that the king is going to show up tomorrow. If you've been following on the previous video, we talked about how God had said to Samuel, okay, we're going to give Israel a king. The second thing we're going to focus in on is Samuel is actually going to anoint the king. We're going to do it privately first. Then we're going to see how the king is made known publicly. That's the third thing. And the fourth thing is, Saul's not going to be accepted by everyone. Saul's actually going to be rejected as king. And we're going to wrap up today's Bible study video focusing on Saul taking Israel to war. Okay? So, I just want to know quickly, let me know in the questions box, which one of these do you think is the most exciting out of today's chapter? Chapters reading from 1 Samuel 9 to 12. Just let me know in the questions box. Just say 1, 2, 3 or 5 so I can know. Um, that would be really helpful. Um, so, let's get into it. So, all right, so let's start with 1 Samuel chapter 9 and see what's in store for us, all right? So, it says, now there was a man of Benjamin whose name Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bechorath, the son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name Saul, a choice young man and a goodly and not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he, from his shoulders and upward higher than any of the people. Okay, so first thing we get insights into is a key figure called Saul. Okay, the scripture tells us about this guy Saul. And what does it tell us? It says he was goodly, is one of the things it says. But it says he was higher, okay, from the shoulders up than anyone else. Okay? Now that is obviously a really exciting introduction to be known as the guy who's higher from the shoulders up than anybody else. So what let's see what it says next. And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost, and Kish said to Saul his son, Take now one of the servants with thee and arise, go seek the asses. And he passed through Mount Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they found not. Then they passed through the land of Shalim and not. And he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they found not. When they were come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servants that with him, Come and let us return, lest my father leave for the asses and take thought for us. So, quite a smart son. What does he say? Okay, so they go off travelling. Okay, first and foremost, and they're traveling around and they can't find the asses, okay, the animals. So, eventually, what Saul basically says is, he turns around and says, let's basically go back because it's going to get to a point where his dad is going to say, well, forget about the asses, where are my sons, where's my son gone and his servant in this whole time? I don't know where he is, he's going to start worrying about Saul. So he says, let's go back. Let's see what happens next. Okay. Six. And he said unto him, Behold now, in this city a man of God, and he and an honourable man, all that he saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go thither, peradventure he can shew us our way that we should go. Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and not a present to bring the man of God. What have we? And the servant answered Saul again, and said, Behold, I have here at the hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. They're going to do next is they're going to go and visit the man of God, and they're basically going to visit the man of God to get some guidance. Now, for those of you who've been following along, you probably know at this point that 
the man of God at this point is Samuel. Okay? And what do they say? His servant basically says he's got a fourth part of a shekel to give to him. Why was this so important? And why did Saul say, well, we can go and visit him, but I'm not going to have anything? This is why. Okay? Nine. For four times in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For now a prophet was before time called a seer. Then said Saul to his servant, Well said, come let us go. So they went unto the city where the man of God. Okay, so the man of God, okay, or you can say the prophet. And what we basically read there says, Previously, the man of God in olden times was called a seer. And obviously, if the man of God is going to basically give them insights about where to go, they feel that it's necessary to put a gift for the man of God. Okay? Because ultimately, it's your way of saying thank you or giving gratitude to the man of God. Okay? Now, yes, there are people that abuse that office. Um, we've seen that already through the scriptures in, in certain shapes and fashions. Samuel, Samuel was a really righteous man and someone that literally um, obeyed God um, to the fullest. Let's keep going. 11. As they went up the hill to the city, they found young men to them. Is the seer here? And they answered him and said, He is, behold, before you. Make haste now, for he came today to the city. For a sacrifice of the people today in the high place. As soon as you become into the city, ye shall straightway find him before he go up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he come, because he doth bless the sacrifice. Afterwards they eat that be bidden. Now therefore, get you up for about this time, ye shall find him. Okay? So they're basically saying there's gonna be a big feast that the man of God is going to bless, basically. And they're not going to eat until the man of God comes, okay, and obviously blesses the feast. Let's see what happens next. 14. And they went up into the city. When they were coming to the city, behold, Samuel came out against them for to go up to the high place. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before, came, saying, Tomorrow, okay, about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because their cries come unto me. Okay? So this is where we get insights and information that God told Samuel the day before. Okay? That a man from Benjamin was going to be coming and you are to anoint him king. That's what God said to Samuel the day before. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold, the man whom I spake to thee of, this same shall reign over my people. Okay? So Samuel, okay, the man of God, has been told now that there was a man of Benjamin that was going to come. This guy, Saul, is the person you're supposed to anoint king. Okay? Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house? And Samuel answered Saul and said, I, the seer, go up before me unto the high place, for ye shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let thee go, and will tell thee all that in thine heart. So Saul walks up to the man of God, obviously he doesn't know what he, what he looks like, I guess. And he basically says to him, where's the seer's house? Where Where is it? And Samuel says, okay, I'm the seer. Go up before me. Um, you're going to come to this feast today. Okay, the feast that the women were talking about previously in the chapter. And he says, you go before me. I'll meet you there. And then tomorrow I'm going to tell you things that's in your heart. Okay. So already in the first couple of pieces of text, We've already seen, okay, God will told Samuel that the king would show up the day before. And the next day, Saul arrives, okay, and they have their, their whole in, in discussion. 
Next, what we're going to see is Samuel anoint him king, okay, which God has told him to do. But we'll notice how it's going to be privately, okay? Let me know in the questions box, why do you think Samuel's going to anoint Saul king privately and not publicly straight away? Um, let me know in the questions box below in the comment section. Let's see, let's see what happens next. 20. And as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are found. And on whom all the desire of Israel, not on thee, and on all thy father's house. So he basically says, which is really powerful, okay? Samuel knows about the animals, okay? Now, you might be thinking something similar to what Saul was thinking. How do you know about the animals? Well, obviously, he's a man of God. You can clearly see that God talks to this guy, and God has probably filled him in with all of these insights, knowing that, okay, yep, the guy from Benjamin is going to come, He's going to be looking for these animals. He's not going to find them. This was three days ago, etc. It also gives us insights about the timeline. So Samuel left, Saul left three days ago um, to look for these animals. And now he's realized, you know what? My father's going to get anxious thinking, where am I? Um, and not care about the animals anymore. So let's keep going. And he basically said to him at this last verse 20, look, Saul, you need to be king. And look what Saul says in 21. And Saul answered and said, Am not I a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? And my family, excuse me, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin. Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? So what does Saul say? He basically says, I am not worthy. And he starts talking about how He's from the smallest tribe, as he describes it. And he says his family in the smallest tribe isn't even anyone special. This kind of reminds me of Gideon. Um, I'll probably put a cards up here. You can read or watch about Gideon and see how when God was willing to use Saul, I mean Gideon, he had similar things to say about himself as well, about his family was small and he wasn't anyone special anyway. Okay. 22 and Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the parlor and made them sit in the chiefest place among them that were bidden which about 30 persons okay and Samuel said unto the cook bring the portion which I give thee of which I said unto thee set it by thee okay so 30 persons at this feast and Saul is basically kind of taken it as the special guest, okay? And another powerful thing about this is, what did Samuel say? He said, bring me the portion that I had set apart, okay? He had obviously set this specific portion apart for the king, okay? Or the, or the, the, in, the coming king. 24, and the cook took up the, sh the shoulder and which upon it and set before Saul, and said, Behold, that which is left, set before thee, eat. For unto this time hath it been kept for thee, since I said, I have invited the people. So, so Saul did eat with Samuel that day. And when they were come down from the high place into the city, communed with Saul upon the top of the house. And they arose early, and it came to pass about the spring of the day that Samuel called to the top of the house, saying, Up, that I may send thee away. And Saul arose, and they went both of them, he and Samuel abroad. As they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us, and he passed on. But stand now still while I may shew thee the word of God. Okay. So he says, so we can talk. But I'm going to tell you to send your servant on further so we can basically have our discussion. And this is basically the first chapter in today's Bible study which we've covered. We've been introduced to this key character, Saul, okay, who's obviously supposed to be anointed by Samuel, the man of God, the prophet. They gave him a quarter of a shekel. He got invited to a big feast with 30 persons there, and we've concluded by Samuel not only giving Saul insights about him having a relationship with God, i.e. knowing that Saul was actually going to arrive the day before, 
knowing that he was actually in journey looking for animals of his parent from his dad and we climax here basically saying look send your servant further let us talk further and that's it okay so now we get into first samuel 10 and let's see what it says okay then samuel took a vow of oil and poured upon his head and kissed him and said not because the lord hath anointed thee captain of his inheritance okay so the first thing we see straight away okay Saul is anointed king by Samuel but notice who was there when he anointed him king okay all we know is that it was just them two so he doesn't even do this publicly he lets it be known to 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 Saul first by himself you are king now, okay? You're head of the people. Verse 2. When thou art departed from me today, then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulchre in the border of Benjamin at Zelzah, and they will say unto thee, The asses which thou wentest to seek are found, and lo, thy father have left the care of the asses and sorrow for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? Okay? So, what does the prophet do? Okay, he prophesies. And he basically tells um, Saul what's going to happen. He says, you're going to go to this place, you're going to see these these men, and they're basically going to tell you that the asses um, have been found, and ultimately your dad's starting to worry about you, which obviously proves what they were saying was actually right. Next, what do we see? Then shalt thou go on forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor, and there shall meet thee three men going up to God to Bethel, one carrying three kids, and another carrying three loaves, and another carrying a bottle of wine. So not only does he talk about um, the asses, okay, and his father's worries what does he say next he says your ne next encounter is you're going to go to the next place okay okay you're going to go to a place called table and you're going to meet three men and what are they going to have they're going to have with them three kids okay not three babies three kids of the, the flock okay three loaves and wine okay why are they gonna have these things and they will salute thee and give thee two of bread which thou shalt receive of their hands so out of this you get two okay now this is really interesting the specificity in what samuel's prophesying to him of these events why because the, the the more specific the more granular this prophecy gets the more certain he will be that this is from god because yes he could meet a ma free men with these three things okay but at the same time the fact that they're going to have these things and he's not going to give him three loaves he's going to get two loaves okay it makes it more specific it makes it the probability of it being less likely to happen to unfold but it giving god more power showcasing god's power more strongly and showing him that god knows what he's doing okay so let's see what happens next after that thou shalt come to the hill of god where the garrison of the philistines and it shall come to pass when thou art come thither to the city that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tablet and a pipe and a harp before the excuse me and they shall prophesy and the spirit of the lord let's even just write this out okay so next what's going to happen is you're going to meet these prophets and these prophets 
let's say, with instruments. And the instruments they're going to have are a soul tree. What else? Tabret. Pipe. And a harp. Okay. And they're going to prophesy. Why are we spending time to write this out? Because of what I said earlier. This is getting more specific and showing that he is a true man of God and God is actually speaking through him and telling him what's going to happen. Six, and the spirit of the Lord will come upon thee and thou shalt prophesy with them and shalt be turned into another man. Okay? So, within all of this, soul will prophesy. And it, and let it, and let it be when these signs are come unto thee, thou do as occasion serve thee for God with thee. Okay, so all of this stuff, okay, all of these things. Why? What does Samuel say? He says, serve God. Basically, he is with thee. This is me just paraphrasing ultimately. Okay? He says all of this stuff is going to happen so you can know, basically, to serve God and that he is with you. Okay? I've basically kind of alluded to it already. This is all showcasing the power that Samuel has in Samuel's relationship with God. Okay? Which most people know. Now Saul knows this, but this is all happening so he can know to serve God basically and know that the Lord is with him. What's next? 8. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings, to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings, seven days shalt thou tarry, till I come to thee and shew thee what thou shalt do. Okay? So he says, Go to Gilgal. I won't even put that on and wait for him. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. Okay. And the Spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied among them. Okay. So he met the prophets and he prophesied. 11. And it came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets, he. Then the people said one to another, What this is come unto the son of Kish? So also among the prophets. So they see him prophesy, they start wondering, Why is he prophesying? Is he a prophet now? Basically, because they, they know he actually isn't. 12. And one of the same place answered and said, But who their father? Therefore it became a proverb. So also among the prophets. So obviously it became famous. Okay, a famous parable or proverb. 13. And when he had made an end of prophesying, he came to the high place. And Saul's uncle said unto him and to his servant, Whither went ye? And he said, To seek the asses. And when we saw that nowhere, we came to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Tell me, I pray thee, what Samuel said unto you. Okay. So, Sam, Saul's uncle, straight to the point. Okay. He wants to know. What did you say? Because they knew at that point in time, when you go and visit the seer, the man of God, if he talks to you, then you'd obviously expect it to be something powerful. His uncle doesn't waste any time. First he says, where did you go? He finds out where he goes. Now he wants to know, what did Samuel say to you? 16. And Saul said unto his uncle, he told us plainly that the answers were found. Okay. That's here. But of the matter of the kingdom, whereof Samuel spake, he told him not. So he basically told him this and left, basically. Why did it tell him he was to be king? Why do you think he did that? Leave a comment below in the, below the video. Okay. 17. And Samuel called the people together unto the Lord to Mizpah and said, to, and said unto the children of Israel, 
Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the, and out of the hand of all kingdoms, of them that oppressed you. And ye have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of your advers advers adversities and your tribulations. And ye have said unto me, But set a king over us. Now therefore present yourself before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Okay? So I'm not going to write it here, but the previous video we did, okay, which was chapter 4 to 8, we read about how the Israelites basically said, we don't want God to, to reign over us anymore. We want a king like the other nations. So although all of this stuff has basically been all sounding good, you have to remember, okay, as long as, especially if you haven't followed along with us previously, that this is all happening out of disobedience from the Israelites, okay? So God is suffering them in this situation, but this isn't what God wanted for them, okay? So Samuel's basically said, look, you're going to get a king, get into your tribes, okay? And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken, okay? Surprise, surprise. Benjamin, the tribe, was taken. Let's see what happens next. When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was taken, okay? So out of Benjamin, the family of Matri was taken, and Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. And out of the family of Matri, Saul, surprise, surprise, was taken. And when they sought him, he could not be found. So they're looking for Saul. They've obviously got into the tribes. The, tribes, the tribe of Benjamin has been taken. The family of Matri has been taken. And now Saul, the man, has been basically spoken for called out but he can't be found because he's nowhere to be seen 22 therefore they inquired of the lord further if the man should yet come thither and the lord answered behold he hath hid himself among the stuff okay so the lord basically tells us Saul is hiding so bear in mind he already knew he was going to be king so why is he hiding okay 23 and they ran and fetched him thence and when he stood among the people he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upwards okay remember how we got the, how we got introduced okay from his shoulder upwards he's higher okay so it's telling us he's a really strong man Okay, ultimately. 24. And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that none like him were among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. Okay? So the people shout, God save the king. Which seems to suggest that most of the people are in agreement with this. Okay? 22. Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote in a book and laid up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. Okay, So this wraps up chapter 10. What have we seen? Okay, We saw that. Samuel anointed him king privately at the beginning of the chapter. What did we also see? We saw now that the king has been made known publicly. And the last piece of text we saw in that chapter highlighted that he wasn't accepted by everyone. He was rejected by a certain group of people, the sons of Belial. And although these aren't people that should be followed as you follow throughout the scriptures. But one thing they say gives us a hint into something that hasn't been made known before. They say, who is he to save us from distress? What distress are they talking about? We're going to find out as we get into the next chapter. So First Samuel 11 here, um, as we continue, we just talked about how the sons of Belial rejected Samuel as king. And they highlighted something significant. They said, 
how shall this man save us? Okay, save them from what? Let's go on to chapter 11 and see what they're talking about. And also know that we've got one more big thing to cover, which is Saul taking the Israelites to war. So let's see what verse 11 says. Now, then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, make a covenant with us and we will serve thee. Okay, so... Nahash comes to war. Now, what you're going to see next is the scripture is going to give you insights. The scripture does this from time to time where you'll get insights about an event and then time will go past, more stuff will happen. And then there'll be one verse or one little piece of text here or there, which will give you insights about what happened previously. Okay. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, on this will I make with you, that I may thrust out all your eyes and lay it a reproach upon all Israel. So he's basically, he's not messing around. He's basically saying, look, I'm not coming to play. I'm coming to make servants of you um, straight away, okay, and basically oppress you. Three, and the elders of Jabesh said unto him, give us seven days respite that we may send messengers unto all the coasts of Israel. And then if no man to save us, we will come out to thee. So they basically say, look, okay, we'll serve you, okay, after seven days. <laughs> and their whole task is, or their whole mindset is, we want to go and see if someone can basically deliver them, okay? And if there's no one to deliver them, then they'll basically end up as and then they'll basically end up as just um, slaves ultimately that are being oppressed for then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul and told the tidings in the ears of the people and all the people lifted up their voices and wept okay so everyone's weeping here And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field, and Saul said, What the people that they weep? And they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those things, and his anger was kindled greatly. And he took a yoke of oxen and hewed them in pieces, and sent throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of the messenger, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen, and the fear of the Lord fell on the people and they came out with one consent. Okay. So Saul basically puts in pieces an animal and basically says look, this is basically going to be a prophetic example. If we go to war and you don't come with us, this is what's going to happen to your oxen. And him doing that basically got everyone scared to the point where they're saying, okay, you know what, let's do it, okay? Hey, and when he numbered them in Bezek, the children of Israel were 300,000 and the men of Judah 30,000, okay? And they said unto the messengers that came, Thus shall you say unto the men of Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow by the sun be hot, ye shall have help. And the messengers came and shewed to the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. Therefore the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will come out unto you, and ye shall do with us all that seemeth good unto you. Okay? And it was on the morrow that Saul put the people in three companies. Okay, so he's dividing the people as a means of attack, okay, on the Ammonites. And they came into the midst of the host in the morning watch and slew the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it came to pass that they 
that they which remained were scattered so that two completely wiped them out, basically. And the people said unto Samuel, Who he that said shall so reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. Okay? So who said this? Who said shall so really reign over us um, and save us? The sons of Belial. Okay? Sons of the devil, basically. Okay? And now after they've actually, the souls delivered them, okay? So save them. Now the people are saying, bring those people that did, didn't basically accept Saul as king and let's kill them. And let's see what Saul does. 13. And Saul said, There shall not a man be put to death this day, for today the Lord hath wrought salvation in Israel. Okay? So Saul delivers them ultimately as king and what does he do he gives god the glory okay and this is the new king showcasing himself in a very special way so far not only has he shown himself to be a really great son and the things he was doing for his for his dad he showed himself to be so far obedient to god's prophet Samuel he showed himself to be obedient to God in a sense he could have taken the honor but he gave it to God okay which is really special 14 then said Samuel to the people come and let us go to Gilgal to re and renew the kingdom there and all the people went to Gilgal and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal and there they sacrificed sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Okay, so we've seen Saul take Israel to war. We've got one more chapter. So First Samuel twelve. Now we've covered all of these things already. What else is there? Well, one thing which I didn't put on is we're gonna now see First Samuel twelve, and this is gonna be sort of let me call it Samuel's monologue. Okay. Because Samuel's going to go on here for quite a bit. And it's going to be really interesting. Um, they're in a good place right now. They've just established their king, in their eyes anyway. They've basically just gone to war. Saul's actually come out, came out and reigned supreme. And now we're going to see the man of God, the prophet in those days, go on a monologue and see what he has to say. 12 verse 1 reads... And Samuel said unto all Israel, Behold, I have hearkened unto your voice in all that ye said unto me. And I have, behold, the king walketh before you, and I am old and grey-headed. And behold, my sons with you, and I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. Behold, here I witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed, whose ox have I taken, or whose ass have I taken, or whom have I defrauded, whom have I oppressed, of whose hand have I received bribe to blind mine eyes therewith, and I will restore it to you. So what does Samuel say? Okay. He's basically saying, look, prove me. Okay. He's basically saying, look, I've served you his whole life. For those of you who don't know, um, Samuel was a gift from the Lord to his mother who had prayed to him and said bless me of a son and I'll give him back to you and God did and because of that um, Samuel was devoted to the Lord and served God all his days okay this is how he ultimately became a prophet so he's basically saying look we did all this stuff I did all this stuff prove me if I ever did anything wrong okay let's keep going and see what he says next or what they say for and they said Thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken all of any man's hand. Okay? So what do they say? They say he's passed the test. Okay? He didn't steal anything from anyone. He was just and upright in his dealings and dwellings as the, the man of God, as the prophet. Verse 5, And he said unto them, The Lord witnessed against you, and his anointed witness this day, that ye have not found aught in my hand, 
and they answered witness okay okay so they confirm it we're witnesses okay you've done nothing wrong to us sick and Samuel said unto the people the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron and that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt now therefore stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord which he did to you and your father to you and your fathers when Jacob was coming to Egypt and your fathers cried unto the Lord then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron which brought forth your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place and when they forgot forgot the Lord their and when they forgot the Lord their God he sold them into the hand of Sisera captain of the host of Hazor and into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the king of Moab and they fought against them and they cried unto the Lord and said we have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served Balaam and Ashtaroth but now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies and we will serve thee and the Lord sent Jerubbabel and Bedan and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side and you dwelled safe and when he saw this is the key verse here okay Verse 12. What does he say? And when he saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, he said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God, your king. Okay? So, when they saw So this gives us context. I mentioned this earlier on. Okay? Sometimes the, what the Bible will do, it will give you, it will give you a story, and then it will later come context. So why did they ask of a king? The scripture said at the time they asked of a king because they wanted a king just like the other nations. Now Samuel was highlighting and saying, "Look, they saw the king of the Ammonites come to war against them." Okay, that was the previous chapter. And what did they do at that point in time? They said, "Give us a king." Okay because they were afraid and Samuel's basically saying you asked for a king when you saw a war coming even though what did he say what was he saying all of these things before he was talking about Egypt he was talking about loads of things that we covered in the book of Judges um, and now he's basically saying but at this particular time you saw the king of the Ammonites and you asked for a king even though the Lord was your king and had continued to deliver you out of all of these different turmoils every time you continue to ask him out of a right heart okay 13 now therefore behold the king whom ye have chosen whom ye have desired and behold the lord have set a king over you okay so fourteen if ye will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. But if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as against your fathers. Now therefore stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Not wheat harvest today, I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain, that you may perceive and see that your wickedness great which ye have done in the sight of the Lord, in asking you a king. Okay. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder, okay, and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Okay, so Samuel called on the Lord. And he answered him. And why is this special? Or why is this significant? For a number of reasons. Samuel alludes to the point, he basically says, look, this is significant because this is a sign to you that you have greatly done wickedness. Okay. Another reason this is really special is because not many people talk about the fact that Samuel had that kind of connection, had that kind of relationship, the gift to basically petition God to send down rain and thunder, okay? It's not something that's typically people synonymize with people like Samuel, it's more so people like Elijah and Moses. Um, let's see what happens next. 
which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. 18. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord said, Fun and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. For we have added unto all our sins evil to ask us a king. So now at this point, okay, now is the point in time when they acknowledge their wickedness, okay? When chapters ago, when they asked for the king, Samuel was distressed, Samuel was displeased, and God said to Samuel, look, they haven't rejected you, they've rejected him. And they said, after Samuel said all this stuff to them, they said, nay, but give us a king, because they were scared okay, of the war that was to come. And now, after all of this stuff, after God has brought a sign by the hand of Samuel, now is when they want to now come and acknowledge their sin, which is a really d dangerous place. 20. And Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart, and turn ye not aside, for after vain, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they vain. So trust in the Lord. Stop focusing and worshiping these false idols or false gods which can't deliver you. And they're vain. They don't do anything for you. Okay? They can't provide anything for you. 22. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great namesake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. Okay, So the Lord's chosen you. He's not going to cast you off um, entirely. Just trust in him and you'll be fine. 23. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right ways. So he's basically saying, look, I'm not going to give up on you. Even though I'm old and grey-headed and all this kind of stuff, I've never defrauded you. I'm going to continue to pray for you and intercede for you on God's, um, on your behalf before God. And I'm going to continue to teach you the right way that you need to go and, and the right way of the things that you need to do. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great he hath done for you. But if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. Okay? And that wraps up, okay, day 88 of Through the Bible in one year, First Samuel 9-12, to we've focused on things like God telling Samuel in advance that the, the man from Benjamin, the king, was going to come the day before, which he did. We read about how Samuel anointed him king privately first and foremost when it was just them two by themselves. We covered how the king, but one specific people rejected him as king because they thought that he wouldn't be able to deliver them out of the hand of the Ammonites, okay, when they saw that war was actually coming. But they actually ultimately did go to war, so it took them to war and actually delivered them out of their hands. And this is what I've dubbed Samuel's monologue chapter 12 where he basically proves to them and says look God was with you all the way coming out of Egypt all of these different times and instead of you to trust in him at this particular time here when they saw war that was war was coming they asked for a king God gave them Saul okay and he basically God through Samuel basically approved them and Samuel tells the Lord to bring down rain and thunder basically even though it's the harvest time, as a sign of them to show that they were actually wicked, okay? So on that note, thanks for tuning in. Let me know in the comment section which one of these things, and include Samuel's monologue, okay, which one of those things was the most exciting out of today's Bible study? Let me know below in the comment section, and as always, subscribe to the channel, and hopefully you can join along with us in this journey through the Bible in one year, in less than one hour a day. Thanks and take care.